God our Father and also and most surely from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's text is the gospel lesson we heard a bit ago, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21, but particularly these words of verse 21, so is the one who is not rich toward God. And this is our text in Christ Jesus, my dear friends. Rose O'Neill Greenhow was a Confederate spy during the Civil War. For a time, she was good at what she did and and she was paid well for her services, but then she was caught. She was imprisoned, and ultimately she was exiled back to the Confederate States where the Confederacy made her an ambassador of sorts to England. But in 1864, as she was returning home from from Europe, the the British blockade runner that she was on ran aground off the coast of North Carolina, and a Union gunboat was closing in fast, so Rose Greenhow needed to get away in a hurry. She climbed into a rowboat, which unfortunately for her capsized in the rough water. And the minute she hit the water, she literally sunk like a rock. Because, see, she had sewn $2,000 worth of gold into her undergarments. True story. And on commenting on that story, a well-known historian said, it's a known fact that we can't take our wealth and possessions with us when we die. But in the case of Rose O'Neill Greenow, it took her with it. And it seems the same thing could be said of the rich fool that we heard about in today's gospel lesson. Perhaps you recall, Jesus had issued this warning, take care. And take care because one's life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Well then to illustrate that, Jesus, the master teacher, went on to tell this parable about a certain rich man. A rich man who you could say already had it made financially. His barns were already full. When harvest time came one particular year, his fields produced an extraordinarily large harvest again. And when he saw that, he couldn't help saying to himself, you have ample goods laid up for yourself for many years. Relax, eat, drink. Be merry. But then remember in Jesus' story, God also had something to say. And what God said to him was this, fool. Now clearly from where he sat, as this man looked at his life and at his future, he was pretty confident that there'd only be comfortable days and abundant pleasure ahead. And yet God saw him as a fool. And here's why. When it came to his assessment of his fortune, it's noteworthy that 12 times in just three short verses, this man spoke of himself and what he did or what he was going to do. Not once did he mention God. He didn't thank God for the rain and the sunshine that made his crops grow. He didn't acknowledge that it was God who'd given him his health and his ability to successfully farm, that God had blessed him with the business sense that he had, or for that matter, that God had given him life itself. Foolishly, this fellow neglected to take into account the fact that his times were in God's hands. And he'd seemingly forgotten that it was God who would determine the number of days that he would live here on this earth. And furthermore, all the while, as he felt so confident about his future, he was blind to the possibilities that were there for him for the present. And he was totally insensitive to the opportunities that he had to use his wealth to God's glory and for the good of others. So again, we call this man a fool. And we call him a fool because that's what God calls him. Sadly, all he had done was turning to naught. 
And not because he was lazy, not because he was dishonest in any way, but he was a fool in that while he was rich materially, he was at the same time spiritually destitute. And because he was at the hour of his death, when his soul would be required of him, he would be an absolute beggar. All the worldly riches that he had accumulated would be gone, and he'd be left to face God's judgment without any spiritual resources whatsoever. But the even sadder thing is that rich fool is not going to be alone in hell because there are many who continue to make the same mistake. Tragically, these people know their work very well. They know politics, they know finance, they know their hobbies, they know their interests, they know the things of this life, they know the things of this world, and they know how to relax, how to eat, how to drink, and how to be merry. But they know little, if anything at all, about the Lord and about the lasting treasure that he offers. And so in the end, in reality, they too are fools as compared to those who are rich toward God. Now, I've got to say that those who are rich toward God also work hard to provide for themselves, to provide for their families, and God blesses their efforts as well. In today's Old Testament lesson, we heard there is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Notice that those who are rich toward God find enjoyment in their toil. In other words, in whatever they set their hands to do. They aren't consumed with worry about the future, about inflation or high prices or a possibly looming recession. They aren't consumed with worry about world affairs, about China or Russia or North Korea about a resurgence of COVID or whatever the next pandemic might be, or for that matter, anything over which they have no control because they realize that their future is in God's hands. And they also know and they also trust in God. They know that they can count on his grace. They know that they can count on his love. They can trust that he can and that he will bring ultimate good out of absolutely every situation. And what's more, they know that there are more important riches than earthly possessions, than earthly pleasures. By faith, they know that the greatest treasures they have are the forgiveness of sins that Jesus purchased at the cross. For Jesus' sake, they now have the assurance of God's abiding and loving presence, his blessing here in time, this very moment, and the guarantee of a heavenly heritage and the promise of eternal salvation. Those friends are the greatest treasures because they are riches that God has given us in Christ Jesus our Lord, and they are blessings that last forever. Jim and Jack grew up together near Louisville, Kentucky. They both came from rather wealthy families, and there was always this rivalry between them in everything they did, in sports, in school grades, in Monopoly games, you name it. Well, with the passing of the years, they grew up to become Kentucky gentlemen in, in their own rights. And each of them came to acquire a stable, and each was extremely passionate about racing horses. And by the way, that rivalry between them, it continued strong as ever. Well, one spring, they each entered a horse in the local derby. And as surprising, both of them, more than anything, wanted to win the race, which prompted Jack to get the idea, maybe he should hire a professional jockey, thinking that that might give him a slight edge and make his horse the winner. Well, the day of the race came and the, and the horses were off. Jack and Jim's horses were neck and neck, well ahead of the rest of the pack. 
Suddenly, though, at one of the turns, the horses got their legs tangled, and both horses and both riders fell. But that misfortune didn't deter the professional jockey. He was quickly on his feet. He remounted. He charged to the finish line first, where Jack met him. And Jack was furious. The jockey couldn't figure out what was wrong. He'd won the race. But Jack was upset beyond words. Then, though, it became clear, yes, Jack's professional jockey had come in first. But in the confusion of the fall, he jumped on Jim's horse and crossed the finish line riding the wrong horse. Now, friends, the question our text begs us to answer is this. When we reach life's finish line, will we be riding the right horse? Or put another way, on that day when our souls are required of us, will we merely be rich in the things of the world and be called fools by God? Or will ours be the priceless and lasting wealth of his joy and of his salvation and of his peace? Friends, this morning may each of us take the challenge to honestly and sincerely look at our own lives and look at our own attitudes and examine what is really important to us. And then by God's, God's Holy Spirit, determine anew to seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seeking first the kingdom of, of God and his righteousness, knowing that then, according to God's grace, all the things of the world, of this life, and of that which is to come will be added to us as well. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now again, friends, may the peace of God, that peace that truly does pass all understanding, may it guard and keep your heart and your mind in faith and in Christ Jesus. Amen.